morning and thank you for joining us today. Um, good afternoon and good evening if you're joining us from different time zones. We're glad to have you with us today as we celebrate this year, 2021 International Women's Day. My name is uh, Dr. Chiedo I teach with the African Studies Program here at SAIS and I direct the SAIS Women Lead. The SAIS Women Lead is a leadership training program platform dedicated to advancing and amplifying women's leadership effectiveness as they contribute to solving um, issues of global importance um, around the world. We have had the pleasure of uh, partnering with SAIS Review on organizing this event. The SAIS Review of International Affairs is dedicated to advancing the debate on leading contemporary issues in world affairs, seeking to bring a fresh and policy relevant perspective to global political, economic, and security questions. The SAIS Review publishes essays and bridge, that bridge the boundary between scholarly inquiry and practical experience. The SAIS Review examines contemporary issues in international affairs through its print journal issues, website content, and postcard episodes. <clears throat> so um, a few housekeeping remarks uh, before we start. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A button um, on your screen to ask the panelists your questions. Um, the chat is open for now, so you can say your hellos and uh, we'll subsequently close and open later on during the event. We will um, have a couple polls up for you to um, join and you know, respond to. Once the polls are up, we'll let you know. Um, and so without further ado, I am honored to introduce our distinguished panel um, for this event today. Um, I, I don't think you can get them any better than they are. Um, as, as we contemplated global affairs, global events, uh, it became very obvious to us uh, that this demands um, some attention. And so uh, we have titled the event today, Blocked. <coughs> censorship at intersection of gender, race, and the media. With us today is Eje Temel Kuran. She is one of Turkey's best known novelists and political commentators. She has contributed to the Guardian New Statesman, Guardian New Statesman, New Left Review, Le Monde Diplomatique, Frankfurt, Ronschau, um, The New York Times, and Berlin, Berliner Zeton. Her books of investigative journalism broach subjects that are highly controversial in Turkey, such as the Kurdish and Armenian issues and freedom of expression. Her primary concerns that she addresses are the contemporary criticism of popular culture, mask of, of politics, women's issues, and all other deteriorating identities of humanity. How to lose a country, the seven warning signs of rising populism, is a field guide to spotting the insidious patterns and mechanisms of the populist wave sweeping the globe before it's too late. Jacqueline Charles has been recognized as Haiti's ambassador to the world by former US President Bill Clinton. Jacqueline Charles is a Pulitzer Prize finalist and Emmy award-winning Caribbean correspondent at the Miami Herald with responsibility for Haiti and the English-speaking Caribbean. She has also written extensively throughout her career about the US immigration issues and its impact on the Haitian community. Her reporting assignments have taken her throughout the Caribbean, including Cuba, as well as Liberia, Italy, Kenya, and most recently Mexico, Canada, and Chile to report on the plight of Haitian migrants. Dr. Lita Hong Fincher is the first American to receive a PhD from Tsinghua University's Department of Sociology in Beijing. Lita's latest book, Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China, was named one of the best books of 2018 by Vanity Fair, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, Interrupted, Beach Media, and Autostrado. The New York Public Library named Betraying Big Brother one of its essential reads on feminism in 2020. Lita's first book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, 
was named one of the top five China books of 2014 by the Asia Society's China File, one of the best books in 2014 by Foreign Policy Interrupted, and one of the best Asian books of 2014 by Asia House. In 2018, it was named on the New York Times list of recommended books on China and Time Out Beijing's list of best books on women in modern China. We also have with us Kathy Ginnan. She serves as news director for Pakistan and Afghanistan for the Associated Press. She has covered the region for the AP as a correspondent and bureau chief since 1988 a period that spans the withdrawal of Russia soldiers, Russian soldiers from Afghanistan, the assassination of Benizel Bhutto, the bitter Afghan civil war between Islamic factions and the rise and fall of the Taliban. Ganan was the only Western journalist allowed in Kabul by the Taliban in the weeks preceding the 2001 US-British offensive in Afghanistan. In addition to her coverage of South Central Asia, she has covered the Middle East, including the 2006 Israeli war against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and war in northern Iraq. We're delighted to have you all with us today. Um, and so uh, to start, the, the media, which is the fourth estate, um, holds significant influence over the trajectory and outcomes um, of politics across the world. For the better part of history, um, the media has largely played this role while maintaining its characteristic unobtrusive yet ubiquitous presence. All that seemed to have changed in recent times. The uncertainty around the world created by the unfortunate combination of an increase in nationalist conservative populism and xenophobic anxieties heightened among the masses by biting economic hardships was weaponized by politicians and demagogues for political gains. A key part of this strategy has been the reframing and mainstreaming of anti-democratic and extremist rhetoric, including media censorship and criminalization of press media freedom around the world. A case in point is the emergence and instrumentalization of the phrase fake news here at home. So is the Nigeria's anti-social media bill, which in fact disguises a planned extensive chokehold on media freedom. The list continues across the world. While attempts to constrain the media is an age old phenomenon, it has assumed frightening proportions in recent times. Its current manifestations have also been deeply gendered. Last week, Four women journalists were shot in Afghanistan, three of them murdered at the spot. In the past month, the Coalition for Women in Journalism reported a staggering 97 cases of harassment, threats, assaults, and arrests of women journalists working around the world. According to the same CWI report, 47 women journalists remain behind bars. Four were arrested in February alone. Iran, Turkey, and China are the leading countries for imprisonment. Another often um, yet um, undiscussed and, uh, and very important aspect that fits into the gender dynamics of media freedom and censorship is the wide gender gap in media ownership and leadership. According to the women, Women's Media Center, women run only three of the top 25 papers paper titles in the US, and only one of the top 25 titles in the world. Additionally, the Reuters Institute analyzes the gender breakdown of top editors in the strategic sample of 200 major online and offline news outlets in 10 different markets across four continents. Only 23% of the top editors across 200 major outlets in the sample are women, despite the fact that on average, 40% of journalists in the 10 markets are women. The percentage of women in top editorial positions varies significantly from market to market. In Japan, for example, none of the major news outlets in the sample have a woman as their top editor. In South Africa, in contrast, 47% of the top editors are women. 
looking more broadly at gender inequality in society and the percentage of women in top editorial positions, the report finds no meaningful correlation between the two countries. Countries like Germany and South Korea that score well on the UN Gender Inequality Index have very few women among the top editors. So as we can see, the issues are many. So not only do women have to contend with this exclusion from media leadership, they also have to deal with censorship from external sources. Today's event will explore these issues among others. Um, and so in a kind of moderator privilege, let me start, out, start us off with um, a question that I, I think the, the panelists should uh, each take turn to uh, uh, offer remarks on, um, on how each of you would define censorship, right? Uh, just so we establish a platform for our conversation, perhaps. So how do you define censorship and how has it impacted or manifested in your own work? Um, perhaps let's start with you, Eche. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chiedo. Um, th th this is, it is great to be here and I am honored to be in this distinguished panel. Um, there are several levels of censorship and the most brutal uh, and you know, most obvious one uh, comes from the political power. Uh, and I'm coming from Turkey, so uh, you can imagine uh, the situation there. Probably you're hearing about it, and you already said that it, it is one of the leading countries in terms of uh, imprisonment of journalists. It is so, it is happening in such a massive scale and so rapidly that we cannot, as journalists, uh, cannot keep up the track of the numbers of journalists who are imprisoned, who are released and so on. So it is the snap uh, cases against them. And at some point, and still it is this case, uh, our schedules are full of court cases uh, that our, uh, you know, our colleagues are charged with and uh, we, we have to attend them every other day and sometimes two court cases in the same day. So, um, most of our job has become lately in Turkey to follow the cases on journalists. So we are uh, simply making news out of ourselves. Um, but there are other, uh, you know, uh, other sorts of censorship. And as a woman, and since we are talking about also gender and so on, as a woman, I, in my work, what I noticed most is that if you, the, 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 one of the most powerful auto censorship and the censorship is uh, depending on whether you are fitting the woman, uh, the idealistic woman in their head, in the media's head or not. Uh, being a woman journalist is such an interesting uh, situation in terms of gender, because when you're a journalist and a woman, and uh, Kathy would tell more about this probably, you are a bit of a sexless uh, being especially when you're in the field, when you're doing, uh, you know, war journalism, when you're doing journalism in conservative areas and so on. And especially where patriarchy is extremely powerful, uh, where the, you know, the societies are split, uh, strictly split between women and men, uh, you are somewhere in between constantly. I remember this uh, funny story from, you know, earlier times in my journalism, there was this uh, wedding and I was supposed to be there as a journalist reporting on some issue. It was one of the rural areas of Turkey. Actually, it was an Arab, uh, you know, majority area. And women and men sit, you know, in different places. So for a long while, they couldn't know where to put me as the journalist. Um, so it happens to a woman journalist uh, most of the time. So actually you are starting to auto censor yourself as a, you know, as a being as well, not before starting to write or report something, you are become sexless and you are supposed to be sexless to do your job most of the time, especially in these, uh, you know, conflict areas, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, but then when you are writing, um, they want you to be more women they, uh, you know, than you are, which is interesting because I remember uh, being told my, by my editors to write about women issues, to write about, uh, you know, more emotionally and so on because I'm a woman. 
they don't want you to uh, go into the hardcore issues, which is supposed to be the men's job, especially when you're reporting from war or conflict areas. So okay. it is a very, you know, many, it has very, you know, many layers, the censorship thing, but it, at the very heart of it is uh, actually the fact that what kind of a woman you're supposed to be is decided by the patriarchy and the patriarchal power in the media. Okay, well, interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jacqueline, do you want to um, respond to that? Uh, yes, I, I agree with a lot of, I mean, working, you know, in the Caribbean, um, in a place like, you know, Haiti and Jamaica, where we've been seeing these issues come up or attempts to censor the media, either through the passage of, of laws or discussions about laws, um, you do start to see this, this, this censorship issue. Right now, for instance, in Haiti, we're dealing with the issue of a number of journalists um, who have been attacked. And, and just recently, the president characterized this as, you know, gang members who were dressed up as, as journalists, that these were not really journalists who, you know, who were attacked um, by police who were subjected to tear gas while they were covering, you know, protests. Uh, and so what I am also seeing among myself and other female colleagues, you know, who are journalists, um, there's a lot of bullying that, 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 that is happening either by people who are part of the government or people or we refer to as trolls um, online. Um, you know, for instance, you know, around December, I think I just stopped looking at the mentions on, on, on my Twitter because it was um, becoming too much and it was feeling more like this organized um, attempt to, to shut you up or, or to censure you. And I think that all of us who work in these places of, of conflict or where things are not clear, um, you do go into this sort of a self-censorship um, I realized that I have the benefit on the one hand of being an American journalist, but being Haitian, being from the Caribbean, that also comes, you know, there's the, the, the benefit of that, and then there's the problem with that because of your connections and your ties. Um, it's not like you just get on a plane and you leave and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. So you're always, I'm always wary of that and also understanding of the fact that my colleagues in these countries that don't have the benefit of leaving uh, that there are stories that they can't tackle or by tackling these stories, it comes with certain impact um, and that they themselves may not go after those stories because of that. So, but I think this whole idea today of fake news and we see the rise of social media and we see the bullying that's coming um, out of elected officials, that that is really starting to have a negative impact in terms of press freedoms and in terms of the ability of us to do our jobs. And especially if you're a female, there's that added vulnerability in that. And, and we can talk about that later in terms of what that means and how you are dealt with um, by individuals you're covering or individuals you're trying to get information from. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I think that those, those um, really interesting and exhaustive uh, responses, um, and so uh, perhaps at this point, uh, we'll just go to another question. Um, do you think that um, the rise in media consumption um, as a result of COVID-19 has affected women's representation in the media? And if so, in, in what ways? Um, Kathy, let's start with you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, um, I would have been better on the censorship one, but um, do I think that there's been a rise that because of COVID? I mean, I think COVID um, has brought a lot of people online and um, uh, online for uh, a much longer period um, than previous. Um, do I think that it has impacted the numbers of women um, that are um, uh, able to access or, or, or want to access media online. Um, I don't know that it's a gender uh, issue, uh, the, the, the access and, and COVID. Um, I think certainly, and I, I, I have done some research on, on the um, um, uh, social media during COVID and, and certainly um, it has really been impacted by COVID and by the use. So, uh, but I'm not so sure that it's, it's, it's result, it's a gender sort of related issue, but uh, yeah. Yeah, great. And um, Letta, if 
you don't mind uh, just quickly responding to that one and then following up um, just with the second question. So according to the uh, Polinta Institute, the journalism industry is notoriously inconsistent with pay and women often bear the cost of this disparity. Job offers are often based on salary history and there's little transparency around pay within news organizations. What do you think is limiting pay transparency in the sector and how are women journalists affected by this? Leta, um, on you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I, I mean, um, I think very broadly speaking, the pandemic, I mean, there are so many studies have shown that the pandemic has really exacerbated gender inequality severely. Um, it's forced uh, so many women out of the paid workforce um, to become unpaid caregivers, which uh, of course women disproportionately are unpaid care caregivers, but the pandemic has, has, has reversed many decades of progress actually. Um, along so many different lines. So uh, as for, you know, I, I don't know uh, exactly how it has affected women's representation online, but I would imagine, um, I mean, I'm not doing a study on that, but I would imagine that because women are disproportionately the unpaid caregivers, and that that's very expensive. They have to take care of children in the home. They also have to take care of elders. I personally have spent an inordinate amount of time and energy on uh, becoming the caregiver for my mother who used to be in an assisted uh, living center. And then I had to take her out of there because of a huge COVID outbreak. And that's really seriously detracted from my own professional pursuits. Um, and I am, of course, extraordinarily privileged. Um, and so uh, I think this is going to be an incredibly difficult challenge for, for the entire world, is how do, we, how do we climb out of this massive increase in gender, new gender inequality um, caused by the pandemic? And I, I hope that we can find new ways to create a much more equitable world after this. Thank you. Um, and so, Kathy, in a recent video you submitted to the Coalition for Women in Journalism, you mentioned that we should celebrate the resilience and strength of women, women journalists, uh, to, prove, to move past all the obstacles in their way. Um, do you mind uh, enlightening us a little bit? Um, what has been the hardest hurdle you've had to move past as an individual, but then also um, as uh, a woman journalist in your career? Thank you, Jado. Um, well, um, I, I think, and, and I really, when I, when I said that, I, 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 the women journalists that I've, I've worked with and worked for have had an amazing resilience, and, and I've certainly, um, and the women, you know, that I've had the privilege of interviewing um, on so many occasions have, have, uh, have shown a real resilience. Um, I, I certainly have had a, a number of, of um, personal um, uh, um, uh, it, it, things happen that to 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 have to uh, move through. I was I was shot in Afghanistan, and and uh, my friend and colleague was killed. Um, and I remember people said, "Well, why would you go back to Afghanistan?" And uh, and first I thought, and and my friend who was killed was a woman. Uh, uh, photographer, uh, um, Anya Niedringhaus, who was uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. And, uh, um, and people said, well, why would you, you know, and, and, but you know, for me first it was, Anya would never accept that some one shooter, one person would decide your fate. Second, for me, it was really important to to know that I didn't look at people differently that I would be covering because I think as as uh, reporters, as journalists, um, we have to really be able to listen to people, and if we're looking at them with a judgment in our head and a judgment in our mind, we can't um, uh, we can't tell their stories. We can't even understand. I, I think, and so it was really important for me. So this is on the personal level to come back to Afghanistan and and really. Um, know that I, I was, uh, I, I wasn't looking at people differently. And so, um, and I don't, I'm, I'm, I feel so privileged to be able to, 
um, to tell their stories and, and the strength of, of Afghan women um, is, is extraordinary. Um, and when you talk about hurdles that, that we overcome as women, I mean, um, Afghan uh, women have been targeted. This year has been particularly deadly for um, Afghan women and, and uh, uh, rights workers, but, but journalists. And, and as uh, you said, or uh, as was said at the beginning, was that the four um, uh, this year alone, four, four women journalists were killed in Afghanistan. So I think professionally, um, uh, uh, there's that resilience to say, I'm not going to be, uh, you're not going to intimidate me and I'm not going to allow you to uh, allow some incident or happening define me or, or, or um, dictate how I behave or hold, hold me hostage to a fear. And, and I think that's where our resilience and our, our uh, abilities, and, and often I find the, the ones that are best able to articulate that or best able to internalize and actually make it a reality are often women. And so, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your whole question or just went off on a tangent. But. No, you did answer the question. So thank you very much. Um, Jacqueline, uh, to what extent do you think there is a difference um, between the way the international community promotes women's involvement in political uh, and peace processes um, and the reality on the ground, right? So, for example, uh, the UN uh, International Crisis Group and the International Rescue Committee highlights the role and importance of women in peace and political processes. But does this actually translate to national news coverage and national messaging? Um, women seem to be a precondition at the international level, but appear to be an afterthought um, at the national level. Um, why do you think this is so, or would you read that as the case um, in your coverage? I think, you know, one of the things that I find with the international community is they, they miss things on the ground. They miss the nuance. They miss the, the, the cultural issues that are happening on the ground and they don't understand um, that it takes more than, than speeches or acclamations in order for something to transcend to happen. For instance, um, I can give you the example of Haiti where um, a couple of years ago, the, the UN um, and others in the international community, I think the US also, they were involved in this effort that they wanted to get more women um, involved in politics. Um, they wanted to see more women uh, run for political office, but that requires more than just saying it. You have to understand that when a woman enters politics in a male dominated place like, like, like Haiti, you know, there's this image in people's mind of how she has to be. Um, she almost has to be almost like bandit like, you know, you know, people think about you, you, you know, she has to get this coalition of people around her. I remember one particular incident where several years ago when there was a female who was tapped to be prime minister of Haiti and her friends who are very influential business women were running around town in sneakers painting walls because the campaign against her had turned to that where people were writing things on the walls. So I think if the international community really wants to see this in particular countries, they really have to understand what's happening on the, in, you know, at that level and understand the challenges that women are facing um, and figure out how do you really support these women? How do you address these cultural challenges and hurdles that are there so that we can start to see more? And you have to really support them. You just, it's not just, okay, here's some money, go, bye. You know, you have to really support them, even if they are lucky enough to get, you know, to get elected. And we have to work with young girls. We have to have young girls be able to see that this is not an anomaly, but that they can see a future path. To me, that's where we have to start to really change dynamics in the landscape. It's not just about speeches and it's not just about, you know, throwing a program up and, and, and leaving. That's not going to change anything, even if you get one or two women elected. It's not going to bring about the change that you need. You have to really do the groundwork and understand each particular country's nuanced idiosyncrasies and what's the real hurdle. Great. So what I um, hear you saying is that the international um, organizations uh, need to uh, commit more to um, structural and transformational changes rather than just rhetoric. 
Yeah. Exactly. And they often miss the mark. I mean, there's all oftentimes a disconnect where they try to apply one size fits all. This hap- we, did, we did this in this country so we can come here and do it here and it's going to work. No, it's not. Every country is different and you have to acknowledge that. You have to respect it. You have to work within it. Um, and that's the only way we're going to start to see changes because right now we're not seeing it. And women in these countries, especially in Latin America and in the Caribbean, we face particular kinds of sexism. Um, we, you know, this idea of what a woman's role is. Um, you know, I am constantly having to remind myself at times that, yes, I'm an American trained journalist, but I'm from this environment. So my reaction often is that sort of, you know, feminist American journalist, I have to pull back because I'm in a different landscape. So I have to work within those constructs while not losing who I am. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Interesting right there. Um, AJ. In, in, in December, uh, Turkey was ranked as the world's second worst jailer of journalists uh, by the Committee to Protect Journalists, a New York based in, which is a New York-based NGO. Furthermore, organizations like Gene News, a women-led news outlet, has had a number of their journalists jailed. During a highlight on CNN on January 26th, Emma Sinclair Webb, the senior Turkey researcher with Human Rights Watch, said, that women journalists are not treated as journalists, but as terrorists. What is your reaction to hearing this? What has been your experience as an author who is critical of the government? I think six or seven years ago when I said this, uh, it wouldn't resonate with Americans. But now after Trump, you all know what it means to be run by a authoritarian man uh, who has own idea, who has his own ideals about women and you know human beings and country and they are not very much fitting to the humane values uh, of our basic moral consensus so we have been in, we have been living in this regime for the last 20 years so it's not only women but uh, part of the society that is not supportive of the, of the regime is lab- are labeled they are all labeled as terrorists, and mainly the journalists. None of the journalists are in prison because of journalism. Uh, you know, such authoritarian regimes do not uh, make mistakes, and it, it is the case in Russia, in China, everywhere. They're all terrorists, not journalists. Before putting them in the jail, uh, they are, you know, smart enough to label them as terrorists. So um, it is, um, it is, it's one of the problems in Turkey for sure. But when I listen to all the panelists now, um, I wanted to say that this is not Turkey's problem only. I think it is, thanks to COVID, it is more and more becoming the uh, global problem. Uh, We are facing a rising authoritarian wave uh, all around the world. And unfortunately, misogyny is the wingman of this wave. So it is not uh, coincidental or it's not just random that women are retreating. They are uh, confined to their houses. Uh, They are confined to the the housework and so on. Uh, Or women journalists are more and more labeled as the witches or the terrorists, whatever, or angry women and so on. Um, uh, This authoritarian regimes cannot function unless they are misogynistic and it is, you know, integral part of the ideology. So if anyone, any, any young women who is trying to be a journalist is watching us should know that this is the world she's going to deal with. Even though she's a feminist, like we all are probably, uh, there is the reality outside which is getting more and more misogynistic, which is getting more and more patriarchal. And we are facing a new political phenomenon. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, this brutality coming from the, you know, patriarchal ideology uh, was not as courageous and as proud as it is today. And now it's shamelessness uh, turned to be a political tool and almost a cultural identity. You know, remember the Trump supporters, you know what I would mean, uh, I am meaning there, like, you know, they are proudly uh, ignorant. They are proudly misogynistic, uh, they are proudly right-wing and oppressive and so on. So this is what the young woman journalists will face 
yes, you can be a feminist. You can, you know, go into the details of the uh, terminology that we are using uh, or the political correctness of the uh, our language or whatever. But on the other side, there is this uh, rising brutality against women and against women journalists. Uh, so and I do not think that this is only a problem in Turkey, although in Turkey, the biggest problem at the moment is women killings. They skyrocketed and it's political uh, because it is, you know, if not encouraged, uh, not banned or not, you know, disencouraged, whatever, you know, it's not mm, stopped either by the regime. So, uh, but then this as well will become uh, the problem of the world, of the Western world as well, violence against women. Yeah. So, wow. yeah, this is all I have to say, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and and later, and so uh, like LJ rightly pointed out, uh, this is not a Turkey problem, right, per se. Um, the dynamics between the US-China relations has been interesting to watch, right, to, to say the least. Um, many reports uh, note the increasing harassment of foreign correspondents in China by the Chinese government during the pandemic. The converse, um, however, has been the increasing censorship, right, and uh, muteness surrounding Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islanders in American media outlets. Um, how do you read this? What, what is your opinion regarding this um, unfolding uh, drama? Well, I think there, you know, what is happening in China um, is to some extent happening in authoritarian countries around the world as AJ was uh, describing. Let me just briefly talk about China. So um, China actually kicked out a, a large number of American correspondents and there, there was a huge exodus, um, a targeting of Australian journalists as well. Um, but of course, those foreign correspondents are very privileged. Um, at the same time, they also jailed an Australian correspondent accusing her of being a spy, which um, is uh, apocryphal. Um, so there has been a real intensification of repression of all kinds, um, also very rooted in misogyny, as I write about in my last book, Betraying Big Brother, and I, I call it China's patriarchal authoritarianism. Um, it's very strongly rooted in uh, confining women to traditional roles in, in the home of wife and mother. Um, but this is all part of uh, authoritarian rule in general. So um, there's been an intensification of censorship, um, of jailing of journalists in China. Um, there's also a huge amount of online harassment um, very misogynistic harassment, particularly aimed at women in China. But you also see that outside China as Chinese state media are becoming much more sophisticated um, about their presence on social media platforms like Twitter, uh, which is banned in China, by the way. And I personally have been the subject of massive coordinated harassment misogynistic harassment on Twitter for um, my uh, threads in describing the, the plight of uh, Uyghur women who are, you know, being forced to undergo mass sterilization. Um, so, what, so what's happening in the US is, I mean, uh, gender inequality, misogyny and sexism are global problems. And so each country obviously has completely different problems. And, and of course, in in the US, this is not my expertise, and even though I'm a US citizen, but um, I think I should let somebody else speak to the problems. Obviously, we have massive racism and sexism in America too, um, but America is a democracy. We do have freedom of speech. And so I think in a place like America, we have the problems tend to be more in a huge increase in online misogynistic harassment, which does drive a lot of women offline and silences women. Um, so, but, but every country is different, of course. Thank you. 
Um, and so if I may just follow up on that, um, Kathy, um, social media has become this sort of double-edged sword. In one hand, it has allowed journalists to reach a wider audience. And on the other, um, uh, it has opened the door for online trolling and cyber attacks, often targeting women, right? Um, the sexualization, um, the gaslighting, you know, publishing private information, you know, the list just goes on, right? Um, what's your view on this? What do you think, um, or to what extent do you think uh, the social media campaigns to empower women journalists, uh, like the one started last year by a Pakistani women journalists, right? Hashtag attacks will silence us, and campaigns uh, of the sort have been effective. Um, what other solutions do you see to this? Yeah, the solutions are very difficult. It's a very good question. Um, the solutions are very difficult. Um, they, 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 um, there has to be uh, coordination. There has to be cooperation uh, among different organizations to, um, to, to deal with it uh, quickly with the, um, uh, with the platforms themselves. To, to, and there, should be, there needs to be um, legislation and, and that, that allows you to have recourse when, when you're attacked. If I could also say, there are a lot more women in journalism today. When I was beginning out and, and when I was beginning and, and different. So while, while we're, we're feeling and, and uh, there, there is a, a young journalist coming in should realize that you know, they're coming into this environment, but there's a lot more women in journalism today. And there's a lot more women doing amazing things in journalism and that have uh, um, really um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, been 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 pioneers and 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 yes, the social media is a, is a really dangerous thing and it, and, the, and the threats are, are are very real and they're very problematic. Um, before your threats came in telephone calls late at night, before your threats came in in uh, people following you, before your threats. So the threats are not new. The threats are not. Uh, um, but but the volume because of social media and that's where I think we need to have that cooperation and coordination that goes after these platforms and and has some sort of you know free speech has responsibilities and so there has to be some way to to uh, challenge these uh, um, uh, these uh, trolls and these gaslighters and um, but for me it's social and it is it's there's I'm not trying to to uh, um, uh, to diminish the, the 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 horrors of it because it is and it's and it's very frightening, but it's just a new it's it's not new the threats against uh, journalists and the threats against women it's just given a much wider platform and I think that we have to find a way to um, actually go after the platforms themselves and find legal recourse so that we can uh, have a, a a way to fight them. I'm not sure if that answered your question either. Yes. Though. Uh, I mean, it does. Um, you talk about uh, legal recourse, right? Um, um, pursuing um, legislation that would allow women uh, quick and easy um, uh, recourse to, to these issues. And I just want to make this open to the, the panel, uh, panelists. Um, what are the ways, what are the solutions, right? Uh, are available to women journalists um, in handling this issue. Could um, I just go ahead? No, 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 you first, you first. Well, I was gonna say, you know, I, I, I had an experience recently that was very um, disappointing because um, and it involved Twitter. And, you know, and I'm not sure what is the benchmark that they use to decide that somebody has crossed the line in freedom of speech and that what is being said is, you know, you consider it to be a threat to your person, a threat to your being, and that somebody should be, be removed. Um, and without going into much detail, but there was, you know, contact that was made and they decided that a tweet that was done, that was reported by several individuals, that that was not, you know, that had not reached the alarm of threat yet. And it was about, you know, somebody to me openly threatening a, you know, a journalist, threatening your, you, you know, you as a person. So this really, um, you know, it's very bothersome. Um, and I think that, that uh, I think we, uh, someone said earlier about, you know, people being forced offline, because indeed it is a double-edged sword. We're using social media to, you know, identify trends, 
um, to get voices in to see what's happening. And at the same time, we become subjected to these very coordinated campaigns and efforts that are meant um, to silence us. And I have to tell you that after a while, it does become too much. I mean, you know, we went from the comments on stories where for me, I often get very racist, you know, remarks and, and, and things that at some point we have to turn off comments to certain stories, but now it's being put out there in the social media realm and people feel they're, they're bold, you know, they're very bold and you don't have this recourse. And yet at the same time, we want to protect freedom of speech, but there has to be a line. You know, and, and I don't know where you draw that line, and, and, but I would say that it has to start with these social media, um, you know, much more open um, to us as journalists, as writers in this field, and they have to have some standards and, and give us a way to say, you know, listen, I feel that this is a threat to my life and this person needs to be banned or needs to be removed, and, and that should be it. Absolutely. Uh, Lita? Yeah, so um, there's no question. I really believe that there should be legislation to regulate these social media companies. I mean, just look, for example, look at the incredible difference that was made once Twitter finally at long last banned, you know, the former U.S. president um, for inciting violence. Um, and just, you know, they should have done that years ago. Um, so that that's that definitely should happen, I believe. Um, but in addition to that, we also have to address entrenched gender inequality at all of the media organizations themselves, because the, their, their policies on social media, I mean, you could point to any criteria like gender inequality and pay, um, but their policies on social media presence are completely inconsistent and I believe in many cases quite sexist. So for example, you have you know, women who are describing, who are reporters who have also been raped or sexually assaulted themselves and they've been reprimanded by their employer for describing their own experience. And, and then they're, they're, they're criticized for being not objective the same thing goes for race. Well, if you're, you know, a, a person of color describing your personal experience with racism, your employer may say, well, you're not objective. Well, then by definition, the white male view is seen as quote unquote objective. And that's obviously completely skewed. And so there are so many problems we have to address in a really thorough systemic way to, to root out, you know, this deeply embedded sexism and racism in our media companies um, and, you know, regulate social media companies as well. Thank you. Quite interesting. Um, um, AJ, your website talks about how your mom read the story, Little Blackfish but changed the ending so that the fish returns home at the end. You are still moving around the world, collecting stories, waiting for um, you know, the time to fulfill that desire to return home. Why do you think it's important to collect and share the stories? Um, why do you have a desire to keep doing so? First of all, I wasn't expecting this question. I was so ready to talk about regulations on social media. <laughs> Lovely, lovely question. Uh, couldn't have been more mesmerizing. Um, um, okay, stories. Uh, because we are the only species in the world uh, that can tell stories. And this is the uh, most integral, integral part of uh, Homo sapiens. Through stories we organize, through stories we connect, and through stories we build up things. And sometimes we distract things uh, as well through stories. And uh, that is why, because uh, this is the only way I know keeping myself human. And this is also the way uh, for me to understand the world. And it is the only way I know how to connect to other people. 
a uh, little black fish actually dies or gets lost at the end of the story and she never comes, he, I always thought her she, she never comes back. Uh, so my mother told me that she comes back, she tells stories and everybody loves her. Uh, and probably this is why I tell stories because I want to be loved because I'm a human being, but I also want to love. Actually my need for to love is more than my need for to be loved. And I think this is why people tell stories because in this brutal, shameless and vulgar world, uh, only stories can uh, tell us about the aspirations of the human being rather than the horrible things that they are doing. And this is story, telling stories is the only way to include the human being's aspiration to its uh, history. I think this is why. Thank you. So um, let me just get this right. Did you say that your need to love is greater than your need to be loved? Yes. Wow. That, think, uh, that, is, that is true for all of us. Just we don't want to admit that, I think. <laughs> that, is, um, that is just on a different level. Um, <laughs> Really interesting, uh, yeah. and, and, and I, I'm sure I'm sure somebody's tweeting tweeting that at this moment. <laughs> we have to um, make a panel on that. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, later. So while Turkey was ranked the world's second worst jail of journalists, uh, China was ranked first. What role do you think this plays in laying out the structural discrimination against women and the broader problems with China's economy? politics and development you describe in Leftover Women. And um, is, there a, a, is there a sense um, that, you know, ideas of feminism um, are changing in China um, over the years? And, and, and if so, how so? And um, I don't know, two minutes. Sure. Well, I mean, um, I, I write actually in my most recent book, Betraying Big Brother, I write about this new feminist awakening, a new feminist movement that has uh, emerged as a result of this incredible increase in gender inequality over the last few decades, as China has um, pursued market reforms and emerged from its planned, the planned economy of the past. Um, so, so uh, of course, as everybody here is, has described, in, in China as well, there has been a huge increase in authoritarian repression um, and in misogyny, systemic misogynistic uh, treatment of women and also, you know, binary and LGBTQ people. Um, and that's part of the Communist Party's effort to, to uh, deepen its uh, authoritarian rule over the entire population. Um, but the bright spot is that, uh, so the Chinese government has really tried to eliminate this new feminist movement. And, and basically it started by jailing feminists in 2015, actually on the eve of International Women's Day in 2015, um, there were feminist activists in China, various Chinese cities, who were planning to hand out stickers about sexual harassment on subways and buses. And there was a massive round of arrests in various cities. Um, so I, I, I write about that in the book. But so far, what has really heartened me is that all these different state attempts to silence women uh, by jailing them or by uh, detaining them for brief periods or by punishing them, um, maybe kicking them out of their homes, you know, putting pressure on landlords to kick out uh, feminist activists who are seen as troublemakers. There are so many different ways in which women's rights activists are being persecuted in China, but that has not, by and large, has not succeeded in uh, wiping out what is really an extraordinary feminist movement that has this incredible momentum. And it's incredible, particularly in light of the increasing repression in China. Um, and so with regard to feminist activism in China, you know, I'm continually heartened by the courage and resilience of activists and also just ordinary women across China 
who um, are more and more willing to speak up about their own experiences with sexism. But I have to add that, you know, what is happening with Uyghur and Kazakh and other Turkic women in Xinjiang is, is absolutely horrifying. And, uh, you know, it's being described by many countries, including um, the US Secretary of State as genocide. And that is something that the international community really needs to highlight much more, because there's a huge difference in the treatment of Han Chinese women who are already being uh, discriminated against on a massive level, but then it's nothing compared to the horrors that are being perpetrated against Uyghur women. Thank you. Um, and so while we um, move on to the uh, Q&A, audience Q&A session, I will just um, go ahead and take the second poll question. If you put that up on the screen, that'd be great. Um, and so at this point, we'll take um, a few, some of the Q&A uh, questions we have from the audience members, and I will um, invite uh, Sai's uh, review to do that at this point. Eddie? Okay, thank you so much to our panelists for their amazing responses. Um, as you can see, question two is on the board right now, which is, what are the top three factors that shape media censorship today, in your opinion? Um, earlier, we had a poll question that asked, have you ever been self-censored um, on the basis of gender, race, or other biases? And we found that 42% of our attendees said that, yes, they have self-censored their own work. 13% said, yes, they're a work has been censored by a superior. 18% of you said both. Um, and 26% said that they haven't experienced censorship. So go ahead and answer your question number two and we'll see what the results are for that. Also, um, after this poll question, when you've submitted your results, we're going to move on to the audience Q&A. And so again, I'm Edie Wilson. I'm the editor-in-chief of the SICE Review. I'm joined by Aaron Thomas, who is the managing editor, um, and we'll be rotating back and forth asking the questions that you've submitted in the Q&A box. Um, if you would like your name to be mentioned, please indicate that in asking your question. Otherwise, we will leave your name out to facilitate a more open conversation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first audience question. Um, so we have a question um, about Turkey specifically. It says, in Turkey, there is a law currently proposed to reform the judiciary and allow more freedom of speech and press. Do you think this law will pass? And even if it doesn't, is this a sign that Turkey is willing to change? And I think that's directed to Ms. Temel el -Kuran. Yeah, and, I, and my answer is no. Uh, it won't change anything, uh, even though it can pass uh, due to the, uh, you know, arithmetics of the parliament, parliamentary uh, parliament, but uh, it won't change because Turkey is no longer, uh, you know, it's a place where the only, uh, you know, law is the word of Mr. Erdogan, and everybody knows that. So even though it passes, it won't mean much. And today it's 8th of March, uh, and many women just yesterday were beaten uh, and they were arrested just because they wanted to use their freedom of speech, right to freedom of speech. So uh, nothing would change. I think it's just a you know a window dressing for European Union and for Mr. Biden, <laughs> mostly. Thank you. Our next question is directed at Dr. Hong's venture. Um, it's only through recent BBC coverage that we've really learned about much of the gender-based violence uh, in the camps in Xinjiang. Um, you know it it's a particularly illustrative example of what we're talking about today. Um, how else has censorship and narrative control affected our understanding of Xinjiang and China writ large? Well, I mean, the censorship is coming from the Chinese government, the propaganda apparatus in China. 
So uh, there's, it, there's, it's so comprehensive. Um, first of all, there isn't any real press freedom in China. So the state media is, it, it's all propaganda. Um, and even there are very talented Chinese journalists, mainland Chinese journalists, but then uh, if they speak out too much, you know, they have a tendency to wind up in jail or at least punished or fired. Um, so that censorship then, because uh, it is so difficult for foreign journalists, for foreign correspondents to, even, to work in China now, it's become much worse over the past year with the um, expelling of large numbers of particularly American correspondents, but other foreign correspondents as well. It was already quite difficult um, to get access to what was really happening at these uh, camps in Xinjiang, and not just within the camps, but also happening, you know, to individual uh, Uyghur and Kazakh families and, and women on the ground. Um, I mean, even for foreign correspondents who are based, who are living in China, they tend to live in cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Um, it's, it's already hard for those correspondents to even go to Xinjiang, um, but, but they, they have done so, but every time they do that, you know, they're followed by um, the police and security agents. And um, it's really hard to get a real picture of what has been happening. And so, um, but in spite of all of those obstacles, there has been some really good reporting um, over the last few years. It hasn't just been this BBC report about um, sexual map systematic rape at the detention camps in Xinjiang. Um, there uh, has been really great research um, on the mass sterilization of Uyghur women, um, forced sterilization that has really increased recently. Um, I mean, there are so many different ways in which, I, I don't have time to get into all of the different ways in which um, there's targeted uh, atrocities aimed at uh, Uyghur women in particular because the uh, and this relates to the patriarchal authoritarianism in China that, that I write about as well, um, where the government basically sees women as purely reproductive agents of the state. And so it sees these Uyghur uh, women as being really undesirable and they, they want to um, you know, decrease or eliminate the Uyghur uh, population entirely over time in, in a slow, methodical way. Um, but they also, uh, they also want to increase the number of, quote unquote, desirable Han Chinese babies by trying to boost the birth rate among Han Chinese women. So it's, uh, but, but all, it, the consistent attitude is that women are, biological vessels for delivering babies um, to burst the booth, boost the birth rate um, and also to take care of the elderly that the women are supposed to be, you know, uh, maintaining harmony within the home. They're supposed to get married. And what is really striking is that, um, uh, I mean, you see the demographic background for that is that there is a, a big aging of the population in, in China. And, and in, because the government sees in, increased immigration as not, not a possible solution, um, they, they're trying to pressure Han Chinese women to have more babies and you know, Uyghur women, they, they don't want to be having babies at all. And, um, but but uh, it is very difficult for us to get at the truth. And so it's incredibly important for us to listen to the actual Uyghur women who are telling their stories. I mean, they're absolutely heartbreaking. I, and it's very hard to listen to their stories because they're so horrifying. And, um, but we must pay attention to these women and, and the women, by the way, the Chinese government is now systematically smearing the Uyghur women who are telling their stories, even though these women are now outside of China and speaking to foreign, foreign news organizations. 
Um, but it is really essential that we, what we listen to what the women are telling us, um, you know, by and large, you know, these stories are by and large true and uh, they've been documented by independent research. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a very important issue that I agree we should all be focusing on. Um, I have another question from an audience member who asks, I'd love to know what the panelists think about the trope of the quote, angry black woman and how it is used by certain sections of society to denigrate black women, particularly those in politics who are trying to change the system. How can black women and their colleagues, peers and allies change the narrative attached to this trope. And that's open for all panelists to comment on. Let me just start by saying, um, you know, it's a very complicated issue because I've seen it not just in the United States, but I've also seen this um, in other places around the globe. And one of the things with the US versus some of these other places that we don't really have a lot of black journalists in these newsrooms. But one of the issues that has happened in the US, let me just start from there, is that before this you know, racial reckoning that we saw um, last year, last summer, we had an industry that has been under considerable amount of pressure because of social media and the changing dynamics in media. And so um, you started to see this trend where we were seeing massive layoffs um, across the sphere, and people were no longer thinking about diversity in newsrooms. And as a result of that, we've lost a lot of black reporters. And, and I'm, you know, we've lost journalists of color, but specifically, I'm going to talk about black journalists. You've lost a lot of them and people who can go into the editing ranks. Um, and so that when these stories are being written, whether by black journalists or any journalists, you need that stopgate. You need that person that's saying, listen, the, you know, the tone that's being said here, we need to pull it back or we, you know, you, you need to check yourself, okay? I think that there's a certain tone um, and depending on your newsrooms and where those newsrooms are located um, in this country, uh, you see just different, uh, the story about the same subject portrayed differently. So I, for me, the first thing is we need to get black journalists back into newsrooms. We need to get them into decision-making positions. We need to get them into editing positions. Um, it's not just good enough to, you know, go out and hire a bunch of, you know, young black reporters and don't give them the sort of mentorship or guide. And we don't think about succession plans. To me, that is very important. I think elsewhere outside of the United States, we're also dealing with these issues and challenges. I mean, I remember, you know, uh, a, a, a black diplomat in France, you know, was just really sort of fascinated and asking questions about what it was like to be a black journalist, you know, in the United States, because it was not something that they saw frequently in France. Like I would be an, an anomaly. So I think that this is also where we need to do in these countries where we are starting to see a rise of black female politicians, whether it's in Great Britain or it's a place like Italy, somewhere that we need to get more people who look like me um, to tell these stories. And, and, and we don't necessarily always wanna tell these stories. So even for my non-black colleagues, I think you have to be sensitive to, to these diverse issues and diverse populations. And we have to check ourselves and see how we convey these stories to the outside, you know, outside world. Because oftentimes they're very nuanced, they're not black and white. And all journalists have to bear that responsibility in terms of what we're putting out there and what is the image or what is the messaging that's coming with, with, with the word choices that we use and how these stories are being framed. Uh, I'd like to follow that question with um, one that's open to all of our, our panelists. Um, what do you think that, what do you think the most powerful acts an individual or a news organization can take right now to eliminate or reduce censorship and uh, ensure the plurality of voices in the media? hire people and tell those stories. <laughs> we've, we've cut back. I mean, 
But the, the unfortunate reality of newsrooms is that we, our newsrooms have gone from maybe 400 individuals to 100 individuals and we don't really have the, the, the bodies, right? Um, but somehow we've got to figure out how to report on those underreported communities or those communities or get other voices. I mean, I think newsrooms have to really be sensitive to our report. And we're trying to do this at the Miami Herald, you know, diversify the people we're talking to, the people we're quoting as experts, the people that we're, you know, we're out talking to, putting more voices and stories that it's not just about numbers, even when we're writing about accountability. It's not an easy exercise to do, but I think that we have to be conscious about it. And I think that every reporter in that newsroom has to make it their mission, that it's not a Black reporter's mission or a Latino reporter's mission. It's every journalist's mission to say, you know what, we need to get more women's voices. I struggle with this all of the time. I cover places where women don't feel comfortable speaking up. Women are not usually out there on the front lines because of society that, they, that they're that they in. And, you know, and sometimes I'm beating myself over the head because all the stories, they're, they're men because they're, they, they're, it's about, you know, they're much more comfortable in taking the security risk, right? But so I don't always make that mark. I, oftentimes I'm missing it, but at least I'm thinking about it. And it's part of my personal checklist and saying I have to do that. So I think that we have to take baby steps. And once we start to get these steps, we can move into these tougher decisions that, you know, it requires finance, it requires money, it requires expansion, you know, um, and that's a whole other reality. But there are things that we can do right now that doesn't require more bodies, it doesn't require more money, it's just about responsibility as us as journalists or in positions of decision making. Could I, could I just jump in? I completely agree with everything Jacqueline said. Um, but I, I really think that the that there has to be massive change at the top, at the very senior management levels of particularly these mainstream news organizations, because no matter, they, there are so many diversity initiatives, you know, hiring young women of color at entry level positions. And while that is important, yeah, it just, it has to be change, really sweeping change at the top so that, uh, so that that comes down in all of the major editorial decisions affecting all of the reporters. Can I, yeah, pick up on that. Um, okay. You know, the babies, you know, instead of baby steps, uh, no, well, this is also a baby step maybe. Uh, we might want to remember uh, Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, what they did uh, was not to change things necessarily directly. Uh, but they made people uh, remember to be ashamed of, of themselves. And those who are capable of embarrassment, uh, whether they're an organization or individuals, they retreated uh, during Black Lives Matter in terms of racism, during Me Too in terms of misogyny. So what, is, uh, what would be most effective in terms of censorship is to make uh, the journalists, not journalists necessarily, but media organizations be embarrassed of what they're doing. And this also is, of course, a political act. Uh, it requires a movement to do this. But as an individual, I think what people can do is, uh, is, to, is to read the real stories, the long reads, and, and try to support those people who are trying to uh, be real journalists, despite all the you know, discomfort and the impossibility of it. Yeah, if I, if I could just jump in too, and I agree with everything that everyone has said. And you know, one thing at AP, the, the, the senior people, uh, many of the senior people are women. Um, that whole idea of um, paid internships, because you know, the, the, that whole tradition of internships not being paid, well, you know, it, it really limited those people who could afford to even uh, um, indulge in that. So, so the idea of putting in paid internships that allows for the, the uh, um, people, uh, um, mix of people to come into it. Um, I think too, one of the things that Jacqueline said that we, you know, we, we've been, um, really pushing and, and, and I really, you know, honestly, AP really has pushed this, go for other voices, find other voices to, to, to quote in your stories, to go and tell their stories, to try to, and, and it's a real search and it's a real trying to, to change the thinking of reporters and, and who you're going out and talking.
how you're talking to them and the stories that you're telling. And, and you're absolutely right. They, ha they have to also be in management positions and, and they have to be the ones, the editors that are. Um, and and, and it, it does make a difference. You know, our investigative editor, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's black, he's great, he's fabulous, he's, he's smart. And, and gets the stories, you know, that, that others aren't maybe thinking of. And, and, uh, and even telling your own story and how it was like that we had the story of, of somebody telling what it was like to cover uh, some of these Black Lives Matter um, protests as as a as a black reporter and as a, a, a and a, as a, a woman of color and and it was such a powerful story. So I think there's so many things that we can do and we should be doing. I think we are doing some, um, but I think it's these movements, um, as Asia said, is to to really you know get these movements going where where you have you know people do respond the Me Too movement, uh, the the Black Lives Matter that got people really starting to. Uh, have to think about this and 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 start actually taking steps to to deal with it. All right, that's it. Thank you all so much for your insights on that question. We have time for one more audience question, so I'm going to open this question to all of the panelists. Um, this question asks: For those who have suffered violent acts while reporting, how have you been able to overcome fear and trauma associated with those acts, and continue to report in various locations around the world? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go because you know. I mean, I think I think we we probably all have have um, uh, incidences. Um, I think for me, um, after. Uh, the shooting, and, and even before, you know, I had been um, uh, targeted. I, there were threats that we had to uh, put additional security, um, um, different militant groups, and 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 then with the shooting, I think what you you for me, and and I think it's always a personal um, a decision or how you deal with it is. Um, not allowing yourself to be hostage to to fear, and so you 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 have to. Um, go back into that situation so that you aren't hostage to that fear. Um, I think it, it, is, it also speaks to um, that desire not to allow your fate to be decided by someone else, by an incident, by a, a shooter, by, by, by a, um, um, an injury. Um, uh, I think also it's, it, it's to try to, uh, I mean, trauma, Trauma also can, can give you strength. I mean, you know, it also, there's, there's both sides of the coin. You know, everybody says, well, you know, I'm so afraid. I'm so, but it also can, can give you a, a strength and a, a power that says, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I can do that. And, 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 I, and it gets you thinking internally, or how am I going to um, uh, um, cope with this? And, and, and understanding that, that one, one incident doesn't reflect a, a, a all the people, or it doesn't reflect a, um, a society, or it, and and in some ways it makes you a better reporter because you're listening and 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 hearing, and and your empathy maybe builds a bit more. So I'm 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 not always you know of course there's post traumatic stress syndrome, but I guess for for me I think there's both sides of the coin with a, a traumatic incident, and and um, so yeah I th I think everyone has their their story. Yeah, if I can. Uh, figure on that one. Um, if this uh, person who is asking the question, I couldn't say, see the name, um, if he or she thinks, um, if he or she thinks to start journalism or be a journalist and so on, I have to tell him or her that journalism or telling stories in general makes you forget your fears. And actually everybody has to do what it is that makes her or him forget their fears. It is not that we are not afraid. We just so immersed in doing our job that we forget that we are afraid. So whatever that makes you forget of your fears is the thing you have to do actually in life. So yeah, and s telling stories is that for me and for everybody here probably. So yeah, I hope there will there's someone else who asked this question who will forget his or her fears when telling stories. Yeah, I have to agree with um, both of you guys. It's true. It's 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 confronting that 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 
fear that incident after um, something has happened um, and then not being paralyzed um, by your fear or being paralyzed by the incident. I mean, I've had moments where, you know, I did something and then after I was like, oh my God, I did that. <laughs> but if I had about it beforehand, I probably did not, you know, but I, but in, into anybody on the panel, um, you know, your greatest asset is your instincts. Uh, you, you, you have to listen to it. Uh, you know, and you have to be bold enough and cur courageous enough to speak up if, if something, you know, if you're dealing with an editor and, and something doesn't feel right. Um, because if you are having doubts or second thoughts, it's, you know, it's a, it's a split second. Um, but you, for me, it's been confronting that fear going, you know, going back in and not letting it have that power over you or having individuals um, sort of shape your view of, of a place or a people or a situation. Yeah, I, I would just uh, agree with what everybody else has said, but I, I have to say, I think that there, there is no shortage of incredibly fearless women journalists around the world. My concern is not that these women are not courageous enough, it's that whoever they're working for is not taking care of them. I mean, I have also had my ex share of experiences, violent or traumatic experiences doing my work. And I know I get really caught up in it. And, um, and I think uh, it, the onus really should be on the employers. And especially if you're looking at freelance journalists, my God, I mean, it's just terrible what has happened to so many freelance journalists, especially uh, women who have actually been raped as a part of their work or, or murdered, of course, and obviously went men as well. Um, but I just think uh, th there really needs to be a, these or media organizations have got to take better care of the people who are working for them. That is such an urgent problem. And we will not have, you know, really uh, proper representative journalism until the media companies themselves take better care of their journalists, their women journalists, all journalists, actually. But if I could say, because it is happening with the, with the freelance, there is a recognition. Um, there's an organization that's established, and it's got a whole list of um, uh, protection for for uh, freelance journalists. It's it's access to uh, um, conflict training, um, to um, equipment, making sure that you're properly outfitted. Organizations, AP will not hire a freelancer to do something that a staffer will not do. Uh, that is not, you know, um, when this happened to me, um, there was no shortage of care or, or looking after. You're not wrong at all as far as the, the need for, for better attention to freelancers. The uh, James Foley Foundation, um, uh, um, the, Diane Foley, his mother, James, died in Iraq. He was, he was beheaded in Iraq by the uh, Islamic State. Um, the foundation is doing remarkable work in terms of um, safety for journalists, for um, freelancers. Yeah. So I just say that there is some things happening as well. Right. Um, thank you. We must uh, move on because we just have a couple more minutes. Um, Eddie, do you want to quickly... Um, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to give a quick plug for the SICE review. Um, my colleagues and I are incredibly grateful for this opportunity to collaborate with SICE Women Lead and these amazing panelists that you've heard today. Um, we've enjoyed this conversation on the intersections of gender, race, and the media, and we hope that we can continue these conversations, which is one of the reasons that in its next print issue to be titled who Runs the World, a look at gender and international affairs. The SICE Review will be seeking to critically examine the role of gender, policy, formation, implementation, and impact um, around the world. We found that much digital ink, um, many of the, di or much of the digital ink has been spilled by these panelists um, regarding politics around the world and gender's intersection there. Um, from Jacinda Adern, it's a much lauded handling of COVID-19 to Stacey Abrams' concerted efforts to register almost a million new voters across the state of Georgia, 
women, particularly women of color, have taken on a much larger role in national and international policy spaces traditionally dominated by men. This upcoming issue seeks to take a deeper look at gender in the policy realm. We're accepting print abstracts in rough drafts up until the end of the month, and they can be submitted to sice.review at gmail.com. I will include our email, Twitter handle, and other contact information in the chat. Thank you again to the panelists, SICE Women Lead, and our virtual audience. And I'm going to pass it off to Ms. Charles now um, to give some closing remarks. Um, I just want to tell you, it's been incredible um, to be part of this panel and to hear the discussions. Um, in some ways, it's, it's, it's been like, oh my God, <laughs> um, you know, to hear these issues and you, you definitely see um, that it's not just where you are, your area of coverage, but you see that it's, it's global. global. Um, I'm very much a supporter of female journalists and I will just say, you know, Kathy, it's good to hear that about freelance, but I have a lot of friends who are freelance journalists and I have unfortunately seen where they have been let, you know, um, let down after incidents happen. Um, but I just think that there needs to be all, more of all of us who are on this panel today and I will just hope that it continues. And, and thank you for having me. Um, and to anyone who wants to be a journalist and who's female, I say go for it um, and just, you know, push through your fears and don't let it rule you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we, we, we're definitely um, delighted uh, to have had you on the panel. And um, as we continue, the third uh, call uh, is up on the screen. And so um, do go ahead and uh, respond to that. Um, Letta, please. And uh, well, let's just take 30 seconds because we have, have just about two minutes uh, to the end of the event. Oh, well, I'd just like to thank uh, Slice and uh, Jado, everybody here. It's been a really great discussion. Um, and uh, as a journalist, um, I also uh, hope that we can tell more of the positive, inspiring stories about women in particular who are fighting against the increase in authoritarianism, misogynistic um, oppression and targeting around the world. So that's one bright side. I hope that, you know, there's more coverage of, of that, the, the rise in feminist organizing all around the world, um, intersectional feminist organizing, I should say, because it's also a tension attention to racial injustice as well as gender injustice. But thank you so much for having me. It's been our pleasure. Um, AJ? Uh, storytelling is initially a female job. Uh, so I hope many more young women go into this job and they won't walk alone because we will be there. People like me, women like me will be there to accompany them. And I wish we had a drink after this panel so I could ask Kathy, how was Beirut for you in 2006 after the bombardment? <laughs> I was there as well. So hope to see you in person at some point. <laughs> well, we're certainly looking forward to this. Kathy. Oh, it would be a dream to see you in person. Yeah, I love that. I spent the whole time in the South, I have to say. Um, but it was, well, poor, it was a horrible. <laughs> that happened but um yeah i just want to say thank you so much I, it's been the the panelists have been extraordinary and i think it's inspiring you know i i mean of course we have a lot that we have to to um uh, push forward and we have to redefine what is strength what is uh bravery what is courage i mean we really have to redefine these these as as the women of, of strength and courage and and um i think there that uh more women in in the profession um, are coming up. I think that you know we're going to face more problems because the more we're out there, the more we're in your face. So you're going to have to deal with us. And and so yeah, I I just think uh, everyone has been inspiring. So thank you very much for having me. It's been it's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, panelists, for honoring our invitation. This has been, like uh, Kathy said, extraordinary. Thank you, um, audience, for um, tuning in. Um, and so to close out, um, the theme of this year is choose to challenge, right? So um, it's a call to challenge something, right? Um, choose to, what do you choose to challenge? 
Um, I think uh, a masterclass in that has been uh, the Me Too movement and uh, the Black Lives movement. And um, I'm sure it will continue to challenge the system, um, the, the structural barriers, uh, the uh, implicit biases, and um, hopefully, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, at the back end, hopefully in not too um, distant time, wouldn't have to hold these kinds of events, right? I wouldn't have to cheer when a woman does uh, something extraordinary because uh, <laughs> Men sharing that often, right? Um, and so again, uh, we'll be, this has been just um, our absolute honor to have you with us. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you stay engaged with the Science Men League and with Science Review. Thank you and bye-bye.